people, and welcome to another episode of The Blackboard. Before we get into today's video, which belongs in the weekly series, Faithful Fridays, I want to make sure to give a big shout out to our new subscribers. If you haven't seen your individual names in a video, it's because YouTube is not the best at letting me know that you have subscribed. Every once in a while, I find out through one of their convoluted pages that I have a number of new subscribers and the names are listed. Other times, they send me an email to my email box, which is the blackboard at gmx.com should you ever need to reach me. But in general, I don't know everybody's name as far as the new subscribers. So I just want to say a big thank you and a big welcome to all of the new subscribers. I hope I can count on you to share these videos and help me rapidly build this channel. All right, as they say, and now on with the show. Hello, my people, and happy Friday. Actually, this is quite a special Friday because we just had Thanksgiving yesterday, and I do hope you took time to thank the Lord that he brought you and your family through uh, to another Thanksgiving. This year, 2020, is not only a number, but 2020 is a symbol of clarity. It's a symbol, a symbol of perfect vision. It's a symbol of having one's eyes wide open and seeing things as they really are. I hope that's you, because at every turn, every single day, he is showing us that our media is full of lies. He's showing us that the leaders in this country, uh, you know, whatever you may feel about President Trump, I think he's the realest leader we've ever had. In the White House, I think he's probably the realest leader that we've ever had and certainly the realest one in my lifetime. And I've been walking the earth almost 56 years. Um, and even though I did not vote this time, which I must say I deeply regret uh, not doing, uh, he's definitely uh, a real leader. Now, whether he will retain the presidency or not, we have yet to see. But the point I'm trying to make is that at every turn, uh, the Lord is trying to show us, trying to open our eyes as to what's really going on. So I hope that you have your eyes wide open. If you're here joining me, I'm sure you do. All right. Last week I introduced you to, or at least I did a presentation on, some of you may have already known about Professor Dr. James Cone. And we're going to continue uh, with uh, Dr. Cohn uh, this week. In fact, uh, not only today on Faithful Fridays, but we're going to continue reading from his works all week until we finish this book, Black Theology and Black Power. And I, I find this way exciting because this way I actually will finish the book. <laughs> I have about two or three dozen books that I've started reading and, and have stopped reading at some point or another as I got distracted. But anyway, if you didn't see last week's uh, presentation on Faithful Fridays, I'm going to leave the link in the description box and there will also be a video card at the end of this video. But the book that we're reading from is the groundbreaking book, Black Theology and Black Power. This is where Professor Dr. James H. Cone had the nerve, the gall, the audacity to proclaim that there was a difference between white theology and black theology, and that black theology was much closer in alignment with Christianity than white theology, and that black theology was every bit as valid as white theology. Now, there are some other claims that he made that I don't necessarily agree with, and you'll find that out as we read the book, because I'm going to give you my perspectives along the way. But just the fact that he had the gall and audacity, the nerve, the gall, the uh, audacity to stand up and say what we have long known has been the truth, 
that there is a chasm between black Christianity and other people say white Christianity, but I would say black Christianity and non-black Christianity. Uh, because even the beige people, the brown people, the yellow people, the red people, they don't seem to be moved by the scriptures to fight against injustice as we do. They don't seem to be burdened to move a society towards a unit towards unity uh, like we do. They don't seem to be moved to make uh, sacrifices, uh, you know, to sacrifice anything for themselves they're willing to fight and they're willing to let us fight but whatever they get they keep it to themselves now if we are getting anything here they come to take it and to claim that they deserve a part of it because they're people of color well we ain't no people of color we're black we ain't minorities we're black we're not um black and brown alliance we're black and we're not africans we're ados okay so we have for this man to stand up and make this declaration again this uh this um validates things we have not long known uh and as i said in last week's video the big difference between black christianity and white christianity in particular is white people have the truth but not the spirit we got the spirit but not the truth so that's what this channel is to do bring you the truth so match with the spirit, you will be right before the Lord and wind up on the right side of eternity. All right, let's get started. So again, what we're reading from is Black Theology and Black Power by Dr. Professor James H. Cohn. We're going to start, we're going to skip over this introduction by Cornell West. The book has a um, introduction by Cornell West. I'm not a fan of Cornell West. Um, he is very verbose. He talks a lot. And I know I do too, especially when I'm going off script like I am right now. But Cornell West talks a lot. I, I have a college degree. I don't understand half of what he's saying. And um, just in general, he works on my nerves. So we're going to skip over the introduction uh, by Cornell West. Y'all can get the book. It's very inexpensive and you can read along. That would be great. But we're going to go right into the preface of the 1989 edition. This book, Black Theology and uh, Black Power, was first released, uh, first written, I believe it was in the 1960s, but it is now 50 years old. So I think it was um, first released somewhere around 1964. Um, six, seven, or eight. I'll let's see. I'll tell you in just a moment. The original copyright uh, was uh, 1969. Yes, the original copyright was 1969. All right, let's get into it. We're reading from the preface of the 1989 edition. The book has been re-edited a few times and reissued a few times. Black theology and black power was a product of the civil rights and black power movements in America during the 1960s, reflecting both their strengths and weaknesses. As an example of their strengths, this book was my initial attempt to identify liberation as the heart of the Christian gospel and blackness as the primary mode of God's presence. I wanted to speak on behalf of the voiceless black masses in the name of Jesus, whose gospel I believed and had been great, whose gospel I believed had been greatly distorted by the preaching and theology of white churches. Let the church say amen, because this is exactly my premise and has been my premise. And now I'm talking for myself, Mickey Lee. This has been my presence for at least two dozen years. Uh, so at least uh, at least a dozen or more years, this has been my premise that there that um, the preaching and theology or the preaching and teaching of Jesus Christ has been grace, greatly and grossly distorted by white churches. As I heard uh, someone say, Sister Victoria of driving drive towards transformation, she said the gospel has been colonized. And yes, that's exactly what it has been colonized. Now, getting back to the book. 
Although Martin Luther King Jr. and other civil rights activists did much to rescue the gospel from the heresy of white churches by demonstrating its life-giving power in the black freedom movement, they did not liberate Christianity from its cultural bondage to white European, I'm sorry, white Euro-American values. Unfortunately, even African-American churches had deviated from their own liberating heritage through an uncritical imitation of the white denominations from which they separated. This too has been something Mickey Lee, me, has noted, observed, and, um, and, and I've articulated that black folks were doing fine when we were ourselves. But once we started integrating with these folks and taking on what they had to say as our truth, then we have lost our way. And unfortunately, most black theologians, be they apologetics, be they preachers, be they teachers, they're too afraid to state publicly that there is anti-blackness in the church. Not racism. Let us be clear. Anti-blackness. There is anti-blackness in the church. And there remains anti-blackness in the church as of this moment in which I am speaking to you. And furthermore, white people want to tell black people what Jesus Christ said when they are not doing what Jesus Christ did. Now, I also want to say for those of y'all who believe Jesus is black and he can be black, he can be Chinese, he can be Japanese, he can be whatever, because he's the one that created all of those people. All of those people were created through him. But here's the thing. If you believe Jesus is black, then all you black dudes out there who believe Jesus is black, why are you around here defaming black women? Why are you carrying on in the streets like fools? Why are you running around with your pants hanging down? Why can't you be trusted to raise your children? Why can't you be trusted to go to work? Why can't you be trusted not to kill each other? That's just my little sidebar. Back to the book. All right. So as he said, Martin Luther King Jr. and other civil rights activists did much to rescue, rescue the gospel from the heresy of white churches by demonstrating its life giving power in the black freedom movement. They did not liberate Christianity from its cultural bondage to white Euro-American values. Unfortunately, even African-American churches had deviated from their own liberating heritage through an uncritical imitation of the white denominations from which they separated. So in other words, we spent all this time separating from these people because we could see they were wrong. Then we got into proximity with them again. And instead of criticizing them and continuing to go the right way and calling out them going the wrong way, we just started doing what they're doing. Thus, it was hard to distinguish between the theologies of white and black churches and the images of God and Jesus they used to express them. African Americans, it seemed to me at the time, had assumed that though whites did not treat them right, there was nothing wrong with the whites thinking about God. So in other words, uh, black people back then as now, I think back then black people's eyes were much more wide open now than now you have a couple of generations under me and I'm the first generation of civil rights babies. And these uh, young folk think that something has changed. It hasn't. Blacks then as now could see that white people's God worked for them. Uh, but ours doesn't. Okay. And black people could see back then that the way that white people thought about God was not correct. But at some point they gave up criticizing that and took white people's God on as ours. And it's, it's not the same. It was the challenging and angry voice of Malcolm X that shook me out of my theological complacency. Christianity is the white man's religion, he proclaimed again and again as he urged African Americans to adopt a perspective on God that was derived from their own cultural history. He argued, brothers and sisters, 
The white man has brainwashed us black people to fasten our gaze upon, upon a blonde-haired, blue-eyed Jesus. We're worshiping a Jesus that doesn't even look like us. Oh, yes. Now, just think of this. The blonde-haired, blue-eyed white man has taught you and me to worship a white Jesus and to shout and sing and pray to this God, to this God that's his God, the white man's God. The white man has taught us to shout and sing and pray until we die, to wait until death for some dreamy heaven in the hereafter when we're dead. While this white man has his milk and honey in the streets paid with golden dollars right here on this earth. Now, just as an aside, when I pray, I have absolutely no image of anyone, though, as the first generation of civil rights babies, all of my aunties and grand, my grand, both of my grandmothers, they had a uh, quote unquote white Jesus up on the wall next to Martin Luther King Jr. And usually uh, JFK. So I was born in 65 and this went on until uh, actually recently. So, but I've never had any image in my mind when I pray. Back to the book. Since I was like many African American ministers, a devout follower of Martin King, I tried initially to ignore Malcolm's co cogent cultural critique of Christianity as it was taught and practiced in black and white churches. I did not want him to disturb the theological certainties that I had learned in graduate school. But with the urban unrest in the cities and the rise of the black power during the James Meredith March in Mississippi, June 1966, I could no longer ignore Malcolm's devastating criticism, criticisms of Christianity, particularly as they were being expressed in the articulate and passionate voices of Stokely Carmichael, Ron Karenga, the Black Panthers, and other young African-American activists. For me, the burning theological question was, how can I reconcile Christianity and black power, Martin Luther King Jr.'s idea of nonviolence and Malcolm X's by any means necessary philosophy? The writing of black theology and black power was the beginning of my search for a resolution of that dilemma. Considered within the socio-political context of the 60s, I still believe that my answer was correct. Christianity is black power. Since theology is human speech and not God speaking, I recognize today as I did then that all attempts to speak about ultimate reality are limited by the social history of the speaker. Thus, I would not use exactly the same language to speak about God that I used 20 years ago. Times have changed and the current situation demands a language appropriate for the problems we now face. But insofar as racism is still found in the churches and in society, theologians and preachers of the Christian gospel must make it unquestionably clear that the God of Moses and of Jesus makes an unqualified solidarity with the victims, empowering them to fight against injustice. I want to take another aside here and give some couple of perspectives on things that he would say. He says that Christianity is black power. Now, I would not agree with that. I would not say that Christianity is black power. But what I would say is black people can have enormous power through Christianity. And what do I mean by that? Black people can have enormous power through the obedience to Jesus Christ, which I believe we, among all the peoples of the world, are most uniquely designed for God's service. And why do I say that? Because there've been other people, including Africans, all kinds of people, what we would call Caucasians today, different types of Caucasians, Turks, Persians, uh, Greeks, Arabs, uh, Asians, all kinds of people that have been enslaved before and all kinds of people that have been slavers. So even in our own history, we know that we both were enslaved by Africans 
and we were uh, the slaves, you know, as well. But there's a difference. As far as I can see in all the studies I've done and anybody listening to this, if you have some suggestions or you have some other information to shed light on this, I, I, I want you to. But in all the, the research and, and things that I've been exposed to, there's never been another group of people on the face of the earth that came out of such horrendous situation. And ours was the worst type of slavery ever. And, I, and when I say ours, I mean all the black people of the Americas. Okay. The most brutal forms of slavery were here in the United States and Brazil was the absolute worst by all accounts. But we are the only group of people that have come out of such horrendous situation praising God and looking to unify with our brothers and sisters who, is, who claim to be of Christ. And even those who don't even claim Christ, we're the only ones who preach peace or we had been until recently. We're the only ones who do that. So that's why I say black people can have power through a correct understanding of Jesus Christ and the gospel. Because first of all, then we would be testing every spirit by the gospel as we are told to. And that's what I said last week. And when you do that, then you know who your real ally is versus someone who is just playing you. And because we don't read our Bible with understanding, because we are no longer value being obedient to Jesus Christ, we can play it right and left. People are talking about reparations, black reparations. And now here come the Latinos talking about they want reparations for what? Okay. People are talking about uh, as soon as we talk about and we say black lives matter, then here come every mofo under the sun talking about all lives matter. Well, we're the ones who taught you that all lives matter. And coming from our mouths, black lives matter doesn't mean that all that other people's lives don't matter. We're the ones that have given up. Uh, Muhammad Ali gave up the prime years of his life not to fight in Vietnam for Vietnamese to come over here and act a fool with black people. Okay. And I could go on down the list, but this, this is just an example of it. Now, when you are a real student of the gospel and you are really trying to be obedient to Jesus Christ, yes, I will help you if you are hungry. I will feed you and clothe you. But let you go to a city council meeting and act a fool and, and, and jank me and my people out of what is rightfully ours? No. That's not godly. That's not Christian. That's called being stupid. So, while I will disagree with him that Christianity is black power, I would say that black people can have an immense amount of power both here on earth and in preparation for God's uh, heavenly kingdom by being much better students of the gospel and by returning to the obedience that I believe he most uniquely designed us to fulfill. The other um, thing that I want to say is that um, yes, Dr. Cohn, Dr. Professor Dr. Cohn is absolutely right when he says that Jesus makes an unqualified solidarity with the victims and he empowers them to fight against injustice. Now, the truth of the matter is that just goes to show how ass backwards things are because it, the, the oppressed should be so convicted by the gospel of Jesus Christ that there is no need. I'm sorry, the oppressor, pardon me, the oppressor should be so convicted by the gospel of Jesus Christ that there is no need for the oppressed to have to fight injustice. The very fact that the, that, that the honest has always been on the oppressed and in particular black people. Because as I said, the rest of you so-called colored people, y'all just, just sit on the side with your hands out. And because a few of you march hither and yon, you think you deserve to pull up to the table we built. No. No. And you are every bit as complicit in our oppression as these other, as, as quote unquote white people. But the very fact that the honest to fight injustice has been on the shoulders of black people for generation after generation, more than 500 years in the Americas alone means that the gospel of Jesus Christ has been distorted and 
hearing it, it has had no power on our oppressors. This means millions and millions and millions of white folks have already gone to hell. I'm hoping that any that listen to this message will be convicted in their hearts and open in their minds and that they will avoid hell by confronting the truth of that's not only within them, but within their people. Because the fact of the matter is, just as I believe that God uniquely designed black folks to carry the heaviest burden and to be um, the Navy SEALs of, uh, of servants, I believe that there is a test that has been placed on white people primarily, but all you others as well, all you other non-blacks, that y'all have, have not been able to pass that test. And it's because you think that God thinks of your whiteness the way you do. Back to the book. So, as he said, the God of Moses and Jesus makes an unqualified solidarity with the victims, empowering them to fight against injustice. As in 1969, I unfortunately still see today that most white and black churches alike have lost their way. Now remember this was from the 1989 edition. So 20 years later. He's still seeing the same thing. I'm talking to y'all in 2020. Which is 30 years after the 1989 edition. And nothing has changed. As in 1969. I unfortunately still see today. That most white and black churches alike. Have lost their way. Enslaved to their own bureaucracies. Uh, with the clergy and staff attending endless meetings and professional theologians reading learned papers to each other, seemingly for the exclusive purpose of advancing their professional careers. In view of the silence of the great majority of white theologians when faced with the realities of slavery and segregation, the white church's preoccupation with academic issues in theology and their avoidance of the issue of justice, especially in the area of race, do not surprise me. So again, what he's saying is, y'all so busy writing these papers and congratulating each other on your little theological, theological papers. But when anybody brings up slavery and segregation, when anybody brings up the fact that the reality out there in the world has not changed, uh, he's not surprised by this because they're, they're not concerned with changing the reality of, of the world. They're only concerned with their professional careers. What does surprise and sadden me, however, is a similar situation among many African-American churches and their theologians, especially those who claim to speak and act in the name of a black theology of liberation. In view of Sojourner Truth and Fannie Lou Hamer, Martin King and Malcolm X and the tradition of resistance that they and others like them embody, African-American ministers and theologians should know better than to lose themselves in their own professional advancement as their people, especially the youth, are being destroyed by drugs, street gangs, and AIDS. More black youth are in jails and prison than in colleges and universities. Now, let's be clear. It's black males that are in jail. More black males are in jail than in colleges and in university. And then, yes, if you add up all the youth, they are, we still have a low number but black women black women have gotten on with it black women are in school black women are opening businesses black women entered the professional realm a long time ago so let's be clear this this is black males and i say this because i believe that one of the reasons why you were we are seeing such derelict behavior uh, among so many black males across the country and i'm talking about the united states uh, because black men in other countries don't have not yet reached the level that of, of, of depravity that black dudes in the United States have as a uh, as a collective. Um, but but in any event, I believe one of the reasons we're seeing this is because there's so much vitriol and hatred of black dudes towards their mothers that, you know, God is not mocked. 
And one of the commandments is honor thy mother and father that you will live long and things will go well with you. Well, if you are busy um, spreading vitriol as these dudes have been for the last 40 years, uh, God is not mocked. He's going to start uh, that judgment. So I believe with black females up until recently, one of the reasons why our we have been so successful None, number one is that weird it's demanded of us at home but also number two most of us uh have some tether on jesus now that is there's a number of black women that are beginning to turn away or have turned away and that's alarming but i believe that a lot of it is because we still keep some tether on jesus unlike um a lot of black guys all right back to it more black youth are in jails and prisons than in colleges and universities. Our community is under siege. Something must be done before it's too late. If there is to be any genuine future for the black church and black theology, we African-American theologians and preachers must develop the courage to speak the truth about ourselves, saying to each other and to our church leaders what we have often said and still say to whites, enough is enough. It's time for this mess to stop. Hopefully the reissuing of black theology and black power will contribute to the development of creative uh, self-criticism in both black and white churches. All right. I only want these videos to be 30 minutes long each time. So we're going to stop there and um, maybe I'll just set up my commentary and read the book straight ahead to you next time. All right. It's your Negro with Aptitude and host of the Blackboard, Mickey Lee, uh, signing off. Uh, make sure you are on the look. I hope you've enjoyed this presentation and would very much like to hear from you in the comments section. If you recall, the tagline or motto of my channel is education and empowerment for eternity. We blacks largely have the spirit of God, but are lacking the truth. Thus, our faith in God the Father through Jesus Christ the Son has begun to fade significantly. If this year, 2020, has taught me anything, it is that this is the year of clarity of crystal clear vision for those that desire to know beyond what is force fed by the mainstream media or other archetypical pillars of society, such as the quote unquote church. It is time that black people, in particular ADOS, the most influential of all black peoples and indeed to a large extent of the entire world, it is critical that we begin to see ourselves in the light of Jesus's love and the purposes for which God created us. As I said earlier, our people, wherever you find us, throughout the Americas especially, have been subjected to a type of vilification that has never been seen before. In my mind, that is because we possess a particular type of spiritual potency that Satan would like to see stamped out. Unfortunately, too many who call themselves followers of Jesus Christ are all too willing to be vessels of Satan's use. I hope this video has begun to help reshape the way you think of yourself so that you can shed the many deceptions standing between you and a true healing and saving relationship with God. In this way, you will be prepared to stand on the right side of eternity when your time comes. It's your Negro with aptitude, Mickey Lee, reminding you to help me grow this channel by like, sharing, and subscribing. Hit that notification bell so you know when I'm dropping. And I'll see you next time on the Blackboard. Facing the rock.